live on YouTube at the same time. It's all crazy here. So the reason I wanted to have this live chat was because I feel as though there is this sort of gap between the growers and the florists. And this is a worldwide issue. It's not just here in South East Somerset by any means. And I think there is post-pandemic, and for all sorts of political reasons, all around the world, the supply chain for the big international flower growing systems are shot for this. Um, and now my dog is winding, so forgive me, I'm going to tea cake. Can we let you in the other room? Go on in. So tea cake is going where it's warm. Right, I'm back. Oh, sorry, it's all very busy, but tea cake's got to be on the right side of the door. So um, I feel as though, and I know that there is an increasing market for locally grown flowers because I am rung up and contacted and emailed much more often than I used to be by florists who want to know uh, whether they can buy my flowers from me at wholesale prices. And I'll tell you what I say to them first of all, because I think it's possibly helpful. I say, because my business plan is very carefully arranged, all you growers and all you growers, everybody, you know, well, we're one of the small businesses. So I know what my business plan says. And my flowers, when they're retail, are not especially expensive. Um, so I don't really do a wholesale price. However, they are reasonably priced. So if some of my quite special flowers here are difficult to get hold of for my local florist, then they're welcome to order them from me. And they will not get an especially low price. What's happened, I think, for lots of growers, especially those that started a while ago, like five, ten, you know, more than two years ago, we started at a time when imported flowers were very, very inexpensive. And so it was very hard for us to compete with those imports. And understandably, I completely understand why the florists would look at our prices and roll their eyes and say, you're crazy, I'm not paying those prices. I can get them much, much less expensively from my wholesaler and I can get a bit of choice, I can get, uh, and I can order at 10 o'clock at night and I'll get the flowers delivered at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, I don't have to pay for six weeks, you know, there are lots and lots of reasons why, understandably, a traditional florist using a long-established wholesale system of imported flowers would find dealing with locally grown flowers, especially with small-scale producers, However, the last couple of years have been the last couple of years, and we come out the other side with a lot of flower growers, many of whom are also florists, because they originally went to talk to their local florists, and the florist said, you're crazy, your price is too high, and so they set themselves up as florists, which is completely understandable and normal. And so they have a retail floristry business of their own, or they have a studio florist business, or they're doing wedding clubs, or whatever it is there. Um, and so what happens was they got in the habit of growing a lot of varieties so that they have masses of stock to choose from. You know, if I'm doing a wedding in June, I've got 30 plus varieties to choose from in my garden. And I might need a thousand cents for my wedding. And I know I'm going to have a thousand cents for my garden. That's great. And I think a lot of small-scale growers, like me, are like that. So it's frustrating for more established florists who are used to buying in from wholesalers to not be able to say, I want 25 or 30 wraps or whatever it is, like that. However, I think we can all kind of raise our game a little bit. I personally have put in, am putting in a load more peonies this year so that I will have certainly a good quality, good quantity of peonies in the next two years coming up. Because I feel as though I can sell peonies at a price which will allow me to make a little bit of a living and won't be outrageous, won't be two or three times the price that my florist buyer 
would pay for their wholesaler. The prices for the imported flour, thanks to the complete crashing of the um, of the delivery schemes and the price of oil and all of that. So all of those prices have gone through the roof, and suddenly I'm a bit more competitive. It is important, I think, to remind everybody that if you're growing flowers locally to your area and selling them to your area, unless I'm growing them in Bogota and selling them to a florist in, in Bogota, I have to part on the cost of running that flower farm in, in the UK, certainly, and I suspect in America, and I hope you get some American friends um, either side of from both of these channels here, you know, our costs are higher because the cost of paying to, you know, staffing is more expensive. Um, if, you know, a living wage, pay somebody a living wage uh, just, to, just to help you out of the garden, it's a minimum of £10 an hour. And the lovely thing about flower growers is they tend to have a very strong social confidence. So, <laughs> so they don't have heaps of people kind of working to pay wages for them. And so that, that, that cost will be reflected in the flowers that they sell. And the cost of living in this country is high. And if we are a small scale flower farmer or even a big scale flower farmer, we have to have enough profit to pay the mortgage as well as the water bill and, and, and all these other things. So uh, we're in a slightly different position to where we were two or three years ago. And I think it's time we all said, hello, hello, hello. I think it's really important that we're not even remotely judgmental about why people make choices about their own businesses and how they choose whether they buy from a big importing wholesaler or from uh, somebody like me. That is, that, you know, people have their own business plans and their own capital costs, and nobody is making an easy living. Nobody is retiring a multimillionaire. No florist and no flower grower. So let's be gentle with each other on the pricing and be kind when we you know, appreciate that not everybody has the same business model. So there we are. I'm going to get off my high horse. I'm just going to check. <laughs> my high horse opportunity. I don't get an opportunity to talk to so people quite so often. So this is my moment. Um, we don't, as two industries, have a particularly easy way of meeting you know, the flower growers have their own industry regulating type uh, and community thing, and the florists do. And with both of us, I, I would suggest both industries are a little bit goldfish bowly. So all the flower folk, I mean, I watch, I watch them all on Instagram. All the flower growers talk to each other in a very self congratulatory sort of way, like a little goldfish bowl, going round and round, round, going, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, you're brilliant. And all the florists go around telling each other how brilliant they are. And then the florists say, I don't know where I can find British growing flowers. And the flower farmers say, I don't know where how to sell to florists. Well, hello. <laughs> Let's all talk to each other here. The start. The post on Instagram from Tuesday now has something like 400 uh, responses on it with a great many names of people who are growing flowers. So if you are a flower grower looking for somebody to sell to, and if you're a florist looking for somebody to buy from, then do bookmark that post, and I think we'll do some kind of round up to this whole thing tomorrow, um, and you'll see it, uh, we'll put it on Instagram, and I might put it on a newsletter, which might sort of bore the people who've done interest for other things, but might knit. So we have a list, put, put it in the newsletter maybe, as a little thing, so if you get on, perhaps sign up with the newsletter, and then we can make sure you get this information. So, Let's stop being so in our goldfish bowls and turn around and say, hello, hello, I'm the florist, hello, I'm the flower grower, shall we be friends and talk to each other? Let's be kind to each other. If I, the flower grower, say, I can't sell you uh, my peony for less than X, um, don't go back to the ridiculous price, you'll never make any living. <laughs> so, oh, well, that's understandable. Okay, well, I'm afraid I'm not going to do it well then, but, you know, good luck. Let's be nice to each other about it. Um, I think the market for... Uh, flowers altogether has changed dramatically, and I know this not only because of my customer base. Uh, we have a sort of busy retail bouquet business here at Common Farm, and uh, lots of wedding that's our, our most what we do most of the time. Um, and 
I used to get people coming to me from wedding clubs particularly because they were just sort of curious. Now they come because they're British girls. And they used to come because they like my design, and they like my creativity, and they like what I did with the flowers. But now, definitely, the locally grown aspect is part of the reason they come to me. They'll, I'll get an email saying, I'm writing to you because I want local grown flowers for my wedding. They can, because of the years that have gone by, now assume that the flowers will be very good quality and that the design work will be good. So I think you know, 10, 12 years ago, sometimes you know, people were a bit nervous. But now, oh, thank you for buying badges. By the way, if you want to, feel free to buy a badge. Uh, for which I'm very grateful, it's small amount of money into my pocket. Um, but also, you can always find me a copy, um, and the link if you're on Instagram is in my link tree. You scroll down, and there's a link. And um, if you're on YouTube, <laughs> there's also a link somewhere in the blurb. Anyway, hurrying on. Um, uh, and I'm very grateful for both because I'm not being paid to do this. <laughs> so, any contributions are really, really helpful. So the market has changed, and there is a stronger market for locally grown flowers, definitely. So the customer wants locally grown flowers. Um, and this is my list. Oh, yes. So there are some top tips. I think what we have to do as growers, if we're going to sell to florists, we have to make sure that the quality of what we're selling is as high as they would expect from coming in cardboard boxes from, uh, from an international delivery organisation. Your average florist is used to, I can't even fit the stem on the screen. <laughs> They're used to a 60, 65 centimetre centimeter stem. If your stems are always shorter, perhaps consider having a retail bouquet business yourself and making it so easy to do something else. If you like the idea of growing really good, lots of good long stems in quantity that you could have a mailing list and you could send out uh, on a Friday evening, you could send out your newsletter and it would say next week we're going to have this, that and the other thing, season by Sunday night and I can have it for you to collect on Tuesday or Wednesday. That is a really nice, efficient way and your florist, I would, I would suggest that a florist who gets that email on a Friday and they know that you're locally grown and they know that they're good quality and they know that they're going to be able to get as many, you know, they might not want hundreds, but they might want five bunches of animated, for example. If they know they can get that from you and they need to order it by Sunday, they will do. But I think as flower growers, we're not terribly good at being very business-like with our customers if they're a business customer. Um, I think we could really, we could really all kind of improve on that bit. And equally, for the florist, if you're going to buy from the grower, it's important to know that, just remember that their employment costs are considerably higher than somebody growing in Bogota. Uh, I think, <laughs> I'm nearly about to get off my high horse. Um, I'm, okay, I'm officially off my high horse. I've got all these questions. So loads of people have sent me questions. Nick, is sitting down the other end of the room. I think we've got no feedback. We were a bit worried about feedback, but we don't seem to have feedback. So, so we're still a little bit on YouTube. I'm sorry about that, YouTube. Um, but uh, Nick is sort of 25 yards away. Um, so I'm going to start answering your questions. So thank you very much to those of you who sent me questions. And Nicola is in charge of looking at the questions, reading the questions. She's going to bring me lists because otherwise it's complicated um, looking at the screen as it scrolls by. So Julie and Boo, hello Julie and Boo on Instagram, you wanted to know about advice for finding land. And uh, it's very nice to see you. And I would say, <clears throat> if you're going to rent land, make sure that you can rent it for at least five years. Make sure that it has vehicular access so that you can drive on and off it to pick up your stock. Make sure, I would I, I suggest that you have electricity and running water. <coughs> I'm sorry, talking like this, or get very dry throat. You could say, oh no, I'll be fine, I'll collect all the water off the roof of my barn. I would have a tap just in case. 
and you may be able to collect all the water off the roof of your barn, but it's possible the field you're looking for doesn't have a barn and can't get the paddy stick into a barn. If you find land, <coughs> sorry, if you find land, and this is only in the UK, so I can't advise you to run the world, but look at your local um, authority, the council authority, for what, what you're allowed to do. In the UK, if you find land that has an agricultural tie, it should be okay for you to use it for horticulture. It's sort of according to the the planning people. Agriculture and horticulture, so they don't understand that there's a, a massive difference and everything is completely different. Anyway, so when we took on Common Farm, we rang the planners and told them that we were planning a flower farm, and they said, that was fine, but that if they flew over the flower farm and clearly you were making an Italian garden, they'd have it. But I think long experience is a really, really good idea to engage with your local planning authority, tell them what you want to do, and um, they can help advise you. Their job is to advise you, they'll pay to tell them to advise you. And generally, in my experience, they're jolly nice and helpful, so don't be frightened of your local planners. Um, I wouldn't get take on land that was incredibly acid or incredibly incredibly alkaline. I would try and find something quite useful. I would try and find something that's not too <laughs> um, And I would look for some wind protection. If you're going to buy, uh, if you're going to buy or rent a field on top of a high hill, can you either plant a row of trees to protect your plot, or is there already a row of trees to protect the plot? Can you put a poly tunnel or a barn up to protect the plot? How are you going to protect your crop from wind? Because wind is the enemy of the cut flower grower. There you are. I hope that helps you do the improve. We've only got to six o'clock, so I'm going to really start on fruit. Um, Amber Cottage Flowers says that uh, they need a, a price structure to stick to for florists and public. It's true. You do need a price structure. And what I say to people is don't, for goodness sake, look at what other people are selling their flowers for and either copy or use that as a base. That's not a good idea. What you need to do is work out a cash flow forecast and base the price of your flowers upon your need for an income. Any of you who have come on any of my lifestyle business courses, my career change flourishing course, flower farming courses, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the growing part's the easy part. If you can run an efficient cash flow forecast, and if you play it like a piano, then you will do well. And so you can work out how much you can charge per stem or per bouquet or per whatever you're growing. And then you can be very straightforward with your potential customer, whether they're a florist or a wholesaler, and you can say, this is the price. And if they say, that's very expensive, it's their job to say that, that's very expensive. It's their job to bargain, it's allowed. Who has not bargained in their life? We've all bargained. You don't have to give in to the bargaining. You can say, no, I'm afraid I can't take a, another a different price because I've worked out really carefully <laughs> how much I need for this stem. And say, I'm going to have, you know, I've got 600 stems of peonies to sell and I have to sell them at this price. Otherwise, I'm going to be out of pocket at the end of the month. Then people can say, okay, well, fair cost, I'll pay that. Or, no, oh, I'm sorry, it's still, still too expensive. I'm not paying it. It's fine. I remember years and years ago, and it, this is a great story. When I started out, I had a very small cut flower patch. It was about the size of, I had a, it was about the size of an allotment, a full size allotment. It had two, two small polytunnels and some beds on it. And they were very badly arranged, and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I did have some lovely dahlias, and they were fantastic dahlias. And I had found a guy who was interested by my sweet peas. She said, can I come and see your plot? She came to see my plot. And she said, oh, well, I'll have all those sweet peas for my wedding. And she said, oh, look at those black dahlias, aren't they lovely? And I said, yes, they are lovely, aren't they? And she said, well, I've had to have some of those black dahlias. What are you selling those black dahlias for? And this was literally 12 years ago. And I said, and they were black there. And I said, well, I'm selling them for a pound each. And she went, well, that's much too much money. I can get uh, I can get dahlias from the wholesaler for 32 a stem. And I heard myself say to this lady, well, in that case, madam, you must get those dahlias from the wholesaler for 32 a stem because I cannot compete. And I am here to tell you that I'm still in business. 
so just, you know, stick to that and all will be well. I'm really glad I stuck to my guns. At the time, I'm like, oh, Jesus, I'm thinking, I'm going to go out of business. My name around here is going to be mad and she's going to tell everybody that I'm charging ridiculous prices. And no, no, no. Twelve years later, here we are, and she's long gone. So, you know, um, stick to your guns. But you do need to work out your prices so that you can then defend them. Don't just charge a price that you see somebody else charge. It's meaningless. It's meaningless. We don't work for the Milk Mart Board in 1953. Our prices are not dictated by anybody. Look at what you're growing. Look at what you can sell it for. Decide what you need. Don't be greedy, but be sensible. Anyway, <laughs> lecture is up. <laughs> you didn't think you were coming for a lecture, did you? Um, Cornfield Flowers says, when selling wholesale for florists, uh, what are the pros and cons to selling by stem or bucket? I think it depends on your relationship with the florist. Some florists uh, are uncomfortable with mixed buckets because they don't really know what to do with them. However, my think, what um, wedding florists are quite happy with them. If you know what they're going to do with the flowers and they trust you, to, they trust your taste and they trust the quality, um, I do quite a lot of mixed buckets for florists, which they will then use for their wedding design work, and they know that they're going to get a good mix from me. But I never guarantee so many terms of this or that, because I don't know what the weather's going to be. I would suggest that more florists prefer to be able to order, you know, uh, five tied in a bunch or ten of whatever it is tied in a bunch, because that's what people are used to dealing with. Also, it's very clear, if, it come, if you've got a bucket, and everything is tied in bunches of ten. It's very clear for the florist to be able to sort of that. You know, the florist is, is working very hard and has um, a great deal to do. And if they're picking up from you for a on Wednesday for a wedding on Saturday, um, the more work you have done for them, the quicker their their next steps are. The quicker the wedding will be finished, and the quicker they can get onto the next job. What they're not doing is swanning around. Um, going, oh, I've got plenty of time, and oh, how does this one stem go? Oh, how long will I? Oh, it's not to see. Can I go? No, they're going, right, I've got 20 table centers to make. I've got a bride, five bridesmaids, eight buttonholes, an arch, and um, a hanging ladder. I've got three people. It's nine o'clock in the morning on Friday, and I need to be done by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. They're in a hurry. They've got a lot to do, and they cannot afford to take it longer. So if you give them material which takes longer than, for them to deal with than their normal material, they'll be understandably irritated. That's why it's important that you have a conversation with the florist and say, this is how I do it. And they can say, oh, that's very nice, thanks so much. Um, I'd like to buy some of your flowers in that case. Or you say, this is how I do it. And they say, oh, is it possible, please, that I could have them in bunches of ten? It'd be much easier for me to work like that. You can then say yes or no. Um, but then you both, are, you know, you can talk to each other nicely without having an argument. <laughs> um, um, but I personally, I think people probably explore as much as to buy by the stem. Um, you could, you can still do a mixed bucket, and you can, and I. I know because I'm a florist as well as a flower farmer that I base my whole, you know, wedding work, for example, is all about stem count. I can't work fast enough if I haven't counted them before I start. So even if my florist head, um, if I'm cutting for myself <laughs> for my wedding, just that I'm, for the wedding flowers I'm about to do, the num it's the stem count that's more important than anything else. I can cut a slightly up and down number of roses and number of you know whatever varieties i've got but i need that stem count and i need the balance in the stem count so it needs to be x foliage x filler x active flowers and i know that because i am a florist as well as being a flower farmer so it's it's, it's important to be able to work to understand the pressures that the florists are under um, especially, and I, I think this year is a little bit of a kind of, we're all a bit like this this year, because I think in, to some extent the growers are much more in the seller's market than they have been because the the, um, the logistics are shot to bits. 
Um, so, it, you know, people are going to need your flowers because they can't get them from abroad. But also, I think it's really important that we understand that the florists often are doing weddings this summer for which they quoted possibly three years ago. And they may be able to put the price up a little bit, but I don't think all florists are going to be able to say to all their customers, I'm sorry that the prices have changed so dramatically that your wedding flowers are going to cost a hundred percent more than they did two years ago, two years ago. Because the, <laughs> you know, they did a deal as a contract sign two or three years ago for X amount of money. And so uh, there are obviously a lot of florists this year working for very, very little profit as they try and mop up those weddings and events that have been booked in for a couple of years. You know, none of us expected that. And I think to be kind, we need to be kind to each other. And I think the florists are going to be working their soft off this summer. Um, so, um, and if they do come to you and say, can you tell me when you've got this, that and the other, please answer quickly. Be straightforward. I'll give them straight prices. Don't, you know, can, I, can you or not? They don't want to have food and um, end up talking about the chat. They haven't got time. They're really, really under, under pressure. Um, so, uh, I love this. While Rose Flowers says um, she's looking to use more British grown flowers, and she's hoping this session will be inclusive and collaborative so that we can all grow together. I love that, and yes, and that's why I called it Growing Together. So thank you, Wild Rose Flowers. That has been a great inspiration to me. Katie Johnson Clark, where can she source uh, locally grown flowers from in Cumbria? So Katie Johnson Clark is on Instagram. If you are a Cumbrian flower farmer or possibly uh, West Yorkshire or wherever, then please let her know. Um, Balin, this is my hand, I've been calling Balin to Bloom. Um, this is a really brilliant Be be careful when putting flowers on cake. Make sure that they are not covered in pesticides, fungicides, and um, chemicals which are actually banned in the UK. And uh, often, if you're using pesticides, you just don't know, they're not food grade flowers, are they? Um, and so, if I were going to have a locally grown flower at all, this dog of mine is suddenly insane, I'm going to let her out. Where? Are you going in there? No. She's just whining. I apologize. The dog is just going to whine. She's over excited. We're all over excited. Um, yes, yeah, so be careful putting uh, flowers on cakes. And I think you may find that your local grower is um, really very good at growing flowers that have not been sprayed with anything. The birth expert in edible flowers is Jan Billington at Maddox Farm Organic, who is the queen of the edible flower and has a fantastic business which she's been running for years. She will deliver throughout the UK. Her edible flowers are grown as food. And so if I was going to put flowers on cake, I would ask Jan Billington to deliver flowers to me. Um, right. Move <laughs> on. Okay, Millen DK, what kind of vase life do I get from a bouquet? What an excellent question. So my flowers grown here in my field at Common Farm in Somerset. I guarantee to my customer by Jay, uh, which is sort of what you get from the market anyway. I do have a care card which goes with my bouquets and it says these flowers will work very nicely if I read you my care card. Where's the line caller? Uh, Find a care card. This is my care card. It goes with my flowers. You really can't buy me a copy for this. <laughs> and all that six, six badges. My care card says on the back, how to care for your flowers. To get the best out of your bouquet, please remove all packaging as soon as you can. Lit a centimeter off the stems of your flowers and put them in fresh water. Flowers from Common Farm have not been treated with any flower-preserving liquid, and neither do we supply flower seeds. Giving flowers fresh water and snipping the ends of the stem every day will keep your bouquet in top condition for up to a week. If you do find a few flowers go over during that time, then pinch them out of your bouquet to let the other flowers grow on. Our flowers are cut to order, should be full of scent, and literally grow in the vase. There you go. 
So hopefully I have managed my customers' expectations and I have encouraged them to look after the flowers in a sustainable and sensible way. Um, Sweet Pea Rosa in East London is trying to find growers to buy from, so get in touch if you're Essex, East London, Hertfordshire, uh, around that neck of the woods. Um, she's called Sweet Pea Rosa. L Thompson 254 is about to start a small scale farm. How best to engage with local florists? I'd go and talk to them. Just go and talk to them. Bring them up. I know it's cold calling. It's cold scary. Bring them up. Go and see them. Um, ask them if they are the best talk to you. Would they like to come and see your farm? If you're very small scale, you are unlikely to have large enough quantities of stock for the use. I mean, you know, a florist. I do this when I'm ordering in flowers from other British growers. If I can get it all from one grower, I will. Because then I'm only paying one delivery cost. I am only sending one email. I'm only having to administrate one one payment. Um, I'm only having to report one VAT, one VAT charge, all of that. So um, if you're going to a small grower, do go and talk to local growers, see what they would like you to grow. But if you're going to be too small to be able to really supply maybe five or ten bunches of something at a time that may make you in the short term not so useful for a florist. If you're if this is what I would say to you, you've got a, if you've got a confined space, focus on growing flowers that are really valuable. Don't grow masses and masses of filler. Grow peonies, roses, dahlias, fancy tulips, things that are worth more. Um uh, Catherine Hunter wants to know, is there an online directory for sourcing local locally grown flowers? There is the Flowers from the Farm website. Um, obviously, not everybody's a member of Flowers from the Farm. I'm not a member of Flowers from the Farm. Uh, and that's in the UK. In America, there is also an association. And off the top of my head, I can't believe what it is, but somebody might uh, type it up so that other people could see. But there is an association of flowers growers in America. Um, uh, I know that Flowers from the Farm is a very, very supportive and um, helpful organisation, particularly for new growers who, who struggle to know really where to start. Um, and the only reason I'm not a member is I'm notorious with me with my money. My children are too shy me. So can you imagine the cost of their children? That's why I'm not a member of Flowers from the Farm. One pair of children is actually the same as a year's membership. Anyway, enough of that. Um, the Bristol Flower Company wants to know, if you grow on a small scale and have limited supply, will florists be interested? Depends on the florist. But like I said before, if you've really got small amounts, then I would work on a posy business for yourself. I would look at having a retail business for your own work. And maybe look at expanding some of your crops uh, over the next year or so. This isn't going away, I think. We're, we're, you know, we're, the market is going to be there for a long time um, before uh, I've got news flashing up at the conference. Being rid of it. There's even more news today. Um, Amber Cottage Flowers says um, that florists need to visit farms and be prepared to build relationships and possibly be prepared to put an extra cost for natural flowers. Yes, yes, in a nice way. <laughs> In a friendly way, I think possibly that the cost of imported flowers has got so high now that your that, that the farm flowers that were perhaps a little bit more expensive are now less so. So um, I think it's all coming out in the wash. And that is the end of the <laughs> list. And now I'm on to the current. Yes, there we go. We've got these long rounds. It's endless. It's paper. Okay. Um, uh, yes, one could look at the CO2 footprint of one flowers as a salad, a salad grower might. And I could work out, I haven't done it ever, but I could work out what the CO2 uh, footprint of my flowers delivered to say, you know, my local town, Brewton or Wincanton, compared to the CO2 footprint of flowers that have been imported. It's quite dramatic. Um, and uh, it's certainly something worth. I've never, I've never done it. That's 
but um, but also because I've managed to be lucky, I've worked as hard in my job business without having to talk about it. But I think it's a really valuable uh, thing to be able to do. Um, yes, we need a location list. There is look at the map. If you look at the flowers from the farm website in the UK, there is a map with lots and lots of growers on that map. But obviously, not all flower growers are members of flowers from the farm. Um, we will try and do a mock up of this. Um, we'll see how much information I've got to do tomorrow. I've got wedding, wedding quotes to do. Um, it is a great selling point for florists to use this flowers. It is. I think you can say it and people, and people like it. Um, it. Somebody has an idea that we should have local flower co ops in each area. Again, I think Flowers from the Farm does that. But equally, no, but not everybody's a member of Flowers from the Farm. And I think if you are a really small grower, and there's a, somebody, I had a workshop this week, and somebody said, What happens if I'm a flower grower in this village and somebody else is a flower grower in that village? And I, that was exactly what I said. You talk to each other and collaborate. You know, somebody might be, uh, might, somebody might be, have very good ground for growing dahlias, and somebody might have very good ground for growing hydrangeas. So you grow the dahlias, you grow the hydrangeas, and between you, you make a living. Um, and there are a lot of local regional and uh, farmers markets. I think farmers markets are great for discovering how to use your market. And again, I think I think if you look at what people buy at farmers markets and kind of grow for them, you can do very, very nicely. Don't expect very fluffy headed David Austin roses to be brilliant at the farmers market. They won't like to eat. Um, so you need to sell them for too much money. Whereas some sales actually are great at a farmers market would do very well. So do look at what you're if you're gonna be a farmers market person, I think this is something I cover in my region. In detail. Um, uh, so that is that is <laughs> the challenge of maintaining relationships through the winter months. If that's true, that's true. And I think I think as flower growers in the northern hemisphere, we need to look at the winter and we need to think about how we can how we can uh, keep, have an offering. And if we have if we have an offering, what do we have? I think um, you know, if you look at somebody like Chris and Nelson in Lincolnshire, I mean they are big, big growers, but you know, they're growing millions of tulips, but their millions of tulips are fantastic for Valentine's Day. They have tulips for Christmas, for silly. So not everybody can have tulips because we haven't got the infrastructure for it. But you know, I do a lot of willows in the winter. Um, that's our kind of winter specialty. And uh, there are lots and lots of things that you can do during the winter. You can maintain those relationships. Be honest. I think the thing is to be honest. If you say to your flower grower, your florist, if you're a grower and you're talking to florist, you say, my season is between X and Y, and this is when I will have flowers available. And if it goes well and you enjoy it and you're having a nice time, then you can extend your season. If you make enough money and you can afford it, you can put up another tunnel and you can have an earlier season and a later season. You know, we can all work... We don't have a huge infrastructure in this country for big growers of flowers to supply all year round. But with small businesses growing and uh, and relationships building between growers and growers, we can make that happen a little bit. But we do need we need to know that we can sell that stuff because the capital investment is high. If it, you know, fully tunnels are not cheap. Really, and heating and light, and all the stuff that you may or may not want to add, depending on how green you are. So, you're fully Um Somebody, kindness, sorry, what does this say, Nick? Kindness code of long dug. Oh, that's very nice. A kindness code of con conduct between growers and um, florists. I think that's really, I think we should all just understand that everybody's under pressure. And this is a new way of working for a lot of us. And we all work out how to do it. And sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it's not. And if it doesn't work, we must have to fence. And we cannot, nobody buys from anybody else because they feel guilty or obliged. 
the minute they feel guilty or obliged, we never see them for dust. Um, uh, yes, the flowers from Pharma. You were going to list the things that need to know is selling to florists. But only this is one. <laughs> uh, so, I would, um, I would talk to the florists to make sure that they tell you what they want to know. I would have planned all my prices really clearly in advance so that I could give a price to list. So that never say to a florist, what would you pay me for this? Always say, this is my price. And then they can say, that's too much or fine. It's up to you. Um, uh, decide whether you are going to do a wholesale price. If I were you, I would say, yes, I'll do wholesale, but the price, has, you have to order a minimum amount of X or Y. Um, and decide what that minimum amount is. You know, will you do a wholesale price if they take 35 quid's worth or 250 quid's worth? Your choice. Like, uh, and it depends on your relationship with the florist. You know, there's some people I work with who I really, really get on extremely well with and they can get away with anything with me. But then there are other people who I, if they came knocking on my door, I'd say, oh no, really, I've sold out before they've even asked me uh, whether I have anything. So have that, have a good relationship with them. Make sure that if you're delivering flowers, that your buckets are clean and that the flowers are tied up really nicely and that you cut, you know, look really efficient. Deliver on time. If your flowers won't survive out of water, tell them. If they haven't been treated with any silver nitrate or any, any kind of... Um, flower preserving liquid tell them if when they're doing their design work florists are often used to being able to take the material out of the bucket and lay it on the bench and then work like that picking up stems so the stems are lying on the bench out of water for as long as it takes to create the design i always tell people don't do that keep my flower you know ali major out of water for more than five minutes it's not going to be happy done it um and equally, tell your florist how long you can put some flowers for. If you cut them in the evening, they have no overnight water and you're delivering the following morning, tell them, because those are properly conditioned flowers. If you cut them at five o'clock that morning and you're delivery, delivering to the florist at eight o'clock, tell them you've only just cut them and they haven't had enough drink. They haven't had a good drink. So please don't use them as floral foam arrangements. You can say, just full stop, please don't use them as floral foam arrangements. But that is a whole nother can of worms. Um, Anyway, so I hope that's a good list for things to uh, tell florists. I think educate your customer. Allow your customer to know. Florists, I remember years and years ago, I was um, I gave a talk to a NAPA club, a National Association of Flower Rangers Club in Dunham Community in Portland. And they were very nice ladies, and I did a demo to care. We had a really nice time. And then after that, they ordered. I think four or five buckets of flowers for their flower festival. Anyway, they, this is you know July, some months later. So they came along on and picked up the buckets of flowers. They took them back, and they all arranged them with the flower festival for the flower festival. And they were furious. They came back to me and said they were awful. They flopped. They ended up coming to the supermarket. And for some time after that, my name was mud around Stem of Newton. And I can tell you, that's not a nice place to have muddy name. And it was all because I hadn't said to them, please don't, I haven't, I'd cut the flowers that morning and they haven't been properly conditioned. And I suspect they took them all out, it was a hot July day. I suspect they took them all out of water, had them all on their benches and then put them in floral foam and oddly enough they all died. I'm just gonna let the dog out. Again. Go on. Can you, hello, can you, you have helped in a minute. Um, so, um, Educate your customer. Be honest with them. Tell them what, and ask them in, in advance. Do you need them to be well? Do you need my flowers to be very well conditioned? Would you rather I cut them on the Thursday or the Friday? Let's, you know, florists know what you're talking about. They're not stupid. They're very well educated and they know their products and they know what they're going to do with stuff. Um, like, thank you very much to whoever commented that the lifestyle workshop is great. It certainly focuses the mind, my lifestyle, my lifestyle business workshop. Because the lifestyle business is one that works for you, not the other way around. If you're buying only two styles of vases for customers, what would you suggest? I like <laughs> uh, these ones. I like a sort of tulip shaped um, hurricane lamp vase, and I have them in three sizes, uh, and they are my go to vase. 
can I get them from Microsoft the online in they are the other side of Exeter but I think most florists wholesalers uh, florists some do all sellers have them um would would you grow uh <laughs> the mix oh my gosh it disappeared oh sorry a <laughs> bat Oh, the minimum I would grow of one flower if I was selling to florists. Say I was growing Annie Major, um, I would grow, I would have to say 20 or 30 plants, and then I would have plenty, I would have, I would have enough, I think. I would, if I, I grow, put it this way, I grow 30 Annie Major plants at the time, and I have a succession of about three season and I am cutting some of the two four thousand cents a week and I always have plenty of them related. So I would say that was probably a good number of plants. So um maybe twenty or thirty. <laughs> How's that? Um uh, flowers from the farm aren't always pretty flowers, aren't they? Oh I think you can be a flor no, I don't know. I'm not a member of Flowers from the Farm, so I don't know enough about it and I can't make any judgment. You um, I think they are supposed to be all British. The, okay, the American one, thank you very much for America. Uh, the American Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers for Canada and the US is the American version of Flowers from the Farm. Um, there's a farm, you can have a, get a farm carbon toolkit, which will help you calculate your carbon footprint. I'm going to do this. I'm so going to do this. Um, right. <laughs> I want to thank you. I can see lots of people have been buying me uh, these badges on Instagram. Thank you very, very much. And anybody else, I would be very grateful for coffee. If you're watching on Catch Up later, um, do, uh, you can buy me a coffee. Or go to my link tree, scroll down, so that they can buy me a coffee. And it's very kind of you because uh, this is not paid work. This is just... But it's fun, isn't it? It's interesting. I'm interested in my industry. Are you not interested? We're all interested in our industry, but that makes us interesting people ourselves. Um, I've done that list. I'm just sure I've done all the lists. I've done that list. I've done that list. And uh, stem length. Yes, I think. Um, I think. Let's uh, let's finish. Let's wrap it up. We're kind of. Uh, are we kind of ready to slowly wrap it up next, do you think? If you are going to sell to florists, please remember that florists are used to a very straightforward product which they can order late at night and which online and which can be delivered at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. And it will be looked at possibly a little bit tired because it's been a couple of and may have been there for a while but they can rejuvenate it easily using the tools that have traditionally been at their disposal, so things like flower food and silver nitrate and so on. If you are a grower and you would like to sell to florists, you can talk to them about how you don't treat your flowers with silver nitrate and uh, any flower food. But you can also make sure, therefore, that the flowers you sell them are of a good stem length, and you know, they don't have to be seven. The reason florists want 65 centimetres of stem is because they need to then cut them down for their own use. They use the suppliers not knowing what they're going to do. So they don't know whether if they're going to use them in a great big pedestal or a bridesmaid's posy. It's, so you give your florist a good old stem length and they'll be able to use it for all of the things that they want to do. They don't want to have to say to you, oh, well, imagine the time waste. Oh, I've got to drive the time, I've got to drive five days, eight buttonholes, um, two big pedestals, and then six by seven centuries. So can I have the this long, this long, this long, and this long? Both of you are dying, and you, your business is even bust by the time you've had to have that conversation. So as a rule, give your florist a good sense. Tell them what they, and I, I, I was talking to somebody, um, earlier in the week and they said so what do i say about um 
supposed to grade, you know, grading. And I said, I wouldn't go there. If you're a grower, I would say, I will give you a set, tell your florist what your semblance is. And if they're prepared to accept that, and prepared to pay the price that you have worked out yourself that you need, then you've got a deal. Um, and when you're a small business, we're all tiny businesses. And talk, you know, if Florida are used to having a six-week payment thing, um, I have a seven-day payment thing. Most of my most of my orders are paid in advance. Probably not. <laughs> but then, on the other hand, when I get a bill, I pay it. Um, I don't even wait seven days because then I appreciate that over the last couple of years, everybody has been a little bit close to the wall. And we all need to have all the money we can possibly have in the bank, partly because it's been a tough couple of years, and partly because we don't want to let the tough couple of years we're going to start. So I think I'm going to wrap up now so I can go and set some of this in the box. But um, thank you very, very much for joining me this evening. I have been astonished by the response I had to that real, I posted on Tuesday. If you would like the list of people who put their names there as growers and or florists, just you can bookmark that list. If you want to add yourself to that list, please go over and it's an Insta sorry YouTube it's on Instagram, but you can go over to Instagram and you can add your name to the reel I posted on Tuesday. And if you're posting that you've got flowers for sale, maybe put where you are in the country or the world. And if you're posting that you want to buy flowers, maybe you put where you are and um, uh, in the world so that you can all find each other. Um, there is the flowers from the farm website, uh, but do remember not everybody's a member. And the same with the Association of American Cut Flower Growers. Um, if you want to come on any of my workshops, <laughs> I've got another career change flower farming uh, online workshop coming up in, at the end, towards the end of March. Second of March, uh, the lifestyle business workshop is completely awesome, and less than things in March, and we'll do another one. Um, but the lifestyle business side, don't know, is really very good. Uh, we've got social media coming up. Um, also, in April, I think it's in April. Oh, sorry, 9th of March. <laughs> no, it's sold out, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, yeah, no. Um, so, 20th of April is the next social media with places. And I want to wish you all good luck and good fortune, growers and florists alike. We've had a hell of a couple of years. We're going to have a hell of a season this summer. I think we're all going to be absolutely knocked over with exhaustion by the end of it. And hopefully we'll have made some new friends and some new business contacts. And we will all be being very nice to each other, very understanding of each other. And hopefully all of us, this is making a living. So thank you very much for coming. Feel free to buy me a coffee. Thanks for the badges. Bye bye. Bye bye. I can't even remember where to get out of here. How do I get out of YouTube? Hello, YouTubers. I don't even know. Look, this is me. He does all the work.